Okay, thanks everybody. It's uh, really fun to be here and see so many familiar faces. Uh, I'm going to just give a little snapshot of time. I always forget what years I was the coordinator of Loon Watch, but uh, after 1981, I came to Point to do a master's degree, and after that, got hired at Northlands. I think it was around 86 or something like that. So, what I'm going to do is just really briefly talk about. Uh, Loon Watch, from my perspective, kind of being that middle person in the development of the program. But uh, I think this is the first time I've given a Loon Watch talk, and I'm not going to have a single picture of a loon. Uh, so, what I want to talk about is three main things. Uh, first of all, happy birthday to Loon Watch. 40 years is pretty amazing. Uh, but the, the three main points is you know, Loon Watch started, as Gary mentioned, before we even had ever heard or coined the term citizen science. Uh, it was born not just as a concern here in Wisconsin, but out of a continental context. And the third thing, and I think most importantly, is that Loon Watch is not really about loons. I mean, it's sort of about loons, but it's also, as has been referred to already, it's about the people. Uh, and it's about what the people get out of the loons by doing something for the loons. So, okay, I think this is forward. There we go. So, you know, when I was thinking about this talk, I was like, well, when did citizen science really start? I remember we never used to have that term. It was kind of like not having email or not having phones. You'd never dreamed it up. And I was, so I was kind of on Wikipedia searching around. It's like, well, maybe Thoreau was the first citizen scientist, or maybe you know, some people were talking about Linnaeus, and I'm sure there were many people before that. Maybe the first guy that did a cave painting, or woman, uh, was a citizen scientist, you know, putting bison on the wall of a cave. Uh, but if you look on uh, uh, the Cornell Lab website, they cite the first science, citizen science uh, work in the United States as maybe being a survey of lighthouse keepers. In the 1880s, they were asked to count the number of birds that died getting smucked into the lighthouses. Uh, and then they also talked a lot about the Christmas bird count uh, that was started in 1900. So that you know puts our 40-year birthday in you know a, a little bit of a context. Uh, my husband pointed out to me maybe in Wisconsin one of the first citizen science efforts might have been the prairie chicken counting days with Fran Hammerstrom, some of the Leopold students. But I'm sure you could think of many examples. Uh, for me, when I first started at Loon Watch, one of the really big things was the North American Loon Fund. And this uh, program was started by mostly by a fellow named Ross and Wood, who was a philanthropist, uh, a retired jewelry manufacturer from Boston who lived on Lake Winnipesaukee in New Hampshire. And they started their program to uh, work on loon conservation by funding it with the Voices of the Loon uh, Actually, it, it's probably a collector's item now, a CD. So I was going to have, Erica, can, do you have your button to push? Yeah. Voices of the Loon. <laughs> Little AV here. There it is. So uh, the North American Loon Fund was set up to encourage local and regional loon conservation efforts. At Ross and Wood, he was the man that drove that whole thing. And he was one of those grand old men of conservation, kind of like an Aldo Leopold or a Sigurd Olson. I am very proud to have spent um, quite a few uh, meetings with Ross and Wood over the years. It was also about the time of um, on Golden Pond, looking around, I'm sure uh, there's enough of us older folks here in the room that we all remember this movie. It was a really big splash, and Erica was going to show. Here's Katherine Hepburn <laughs> doing her famous loon call on, on Golden Pond. That was actually filmed on Lake Winnipesaukee, right near where Ross and Wood the loon guy lived and he had met them and he had some crazy stories about that. Um, so what did NALF do? Well, NALF basically funded research based on the sales of those albums, but they also wanted to encourage affiliates. And as Erica mentioned, there are affiliates in every state except a couple and in the province of Ontario. Um, a lot of them formed over the years with the encouragement of North American Loon Fund and their support. Actually, the North American Loon Fund was so successful, they basically put themselves out of business. As the affiliates grew more strong, they lost, people started giving to their local group, and eventually the North American Loon Fund went out of business, gave the remainder of their endowment to Loon Watch, which they now use to fund the Sigurd Olson uh, Loon Research Award. 
So in the same time, what was going on up at Northland College? Well, Sigurd Olson, the well-known wilderness advocate and writer, was on the board at Northland College. He and Malcolm McLean, the president of the college, had gotten together to, uh, well, there was a trustee meeting, all sorts of things, conference. Anyway, they decided to form the Sigurd Olson Institute. Um, and if you think about what was going on about the time that Loon Watch uh, started, I just wanted to put this in context for everybody. What was going on in 1978 when Loon Watch first started? Well, I just was on Wikipedia again, found a few things. Uh, Sweden banned aerosol sprays. It was the first banning of an aerosol. You maybe some of you remember the hole in the ozone. Um, Jimmy Carter made the first Middle East peace agreement. Now you can see that a lot's changed, right? Uh, we're still involved in that, just like Loon Watch. Um, Love Canal was a toxic uh, dump that was in the news, and I wish that Erica would get up and do the Grease uh, Saturday Night Fever. Uh, I don't know how many of you saw that movie, but that'll kind of put you in the context. This is what's going on in the world when Loon Watch formed. Uh, the Loon Watch program was basically the brainchild of uh, folks like Gary and, uh, and uh, Gary Zimmer, Gary Chowick, but Tom Klein was there at the Sigurd Olson Institute and he put together that first beautiful glossy coffee table book, Loon Magic, which sort of set in motion some of the funding base for Loon Watch in the state. When I got to the Institute, uh, there were a few other really critical people involved. One was Mark Peterson, he's the gentleman up there in the upper, for you guys it would be right hand. And in the bottom, uh, Paul Strong, who's now the head of the Shawamig and Nicolay National Forest. Uh, they got together uh, and started building up the Loon Watch scientific base, uh, trying to make it a little more standardized and statistically correct. And shortly after I got to Loon Watch, I remember this uh, researcher walked in one day and said, hey, I'm interested in working on uh, implications of mercury and lake acidification and loons. Uh, do you have any uh, information on what lakes have loons? And I showed him our big folder, and he dived into that uh, file cabinet and didn't come out for a couple hours. He was really impressed. That's Mike Meyer, who you'll he hear from next. But we worked on putting a lot of good science into the program. Uh, in fact, Mike had a crack research team that he put into work right away. Uh, you can see some of the early research crews there. We were, uh, I think we were down in St. Germain, uh, after a hard day's work. Uh, you can see some uh, Sandy Gillum, who later went on to be a researcher herself. Uh, Megan Weinert, who uh, studied, did her masters on loons. Uh, Lona Clausen in the back. She was a canoe uh, outdoors person. She's now a researcher um, biologist in out, out west. Uh, myself there. and. Um, Amber Roth, who's uh, out in Maine is a faculty member now, studies golden wing warblers. So uh, at that same time when I was there at Loon Watch, there were a lot of interesting things going on in Wisconsin. If you think about the conservation of what was going on, I remember when I was there, it was the first time we were all starting to talk about biological diversity in old growth forests. Uh, the Northern Initiatives was a really big deal. The DNR did this big survey and came up with this whole uh, public input on what we, what we want to have happen in the north, keep the north the north. Uh, the stewardship program was fairly young, and I remember having discussions with people over whether lakeshores were worth protecting under the stewardship funds. Uh, people were arguing, why would you want to protect those lakeshores? They're just fine. We need to you know, take care of endangered habitats. But now we look back and that was sort of, uh, lakes are an important thing to protect. Um, we had partnerships over in Minnesota. They were trying to raise loons at the zoo. Uh, Loon Watch at that time had expanded into Minnesota and was doing work over there. And Mike Meyer launched his career that set, set in motion a huge amount of research in our area. The ties to the Wisconsin Lakes Program and what's going on here today to me couldn't be more clear. Uh, there's Lowell Klessig. He was my graduate advisor. He was also the first assistant director at the Sigurd Olson Institute under uh, Bob Madison. So he had ties back to Northland. These networks are really important. Um, and I often think also about Bob Korth, who I couldn't find a picture online of Bob Korth, but he and I were grad students together under Lowell, and he did his master's thesis for the Sigurd Olson Institute, too. So these things grow together. 
But the most important thing about Loon Watch are the people who have volunteered over the years. So whether they're professionals or, or your average citizen, I just threw a few photos up here of folks I could find. Down in the bottom, uh, Sam Robbins, he wrote the book uh, Birds of Wisconsin. He used to do a birdathon for us every year, uh, hundreds of birds. He'd go out all day and raise money. He was on the advisory council. Sandy Gillum down there, loon researcher. Judy Bloom, who started the Women in the Outdoors uh, loon program, Jenny, Jimmy Pickner from the Minnesota Zoo who worked with captive loons. Denny Olson's that crazy guy up there, he's an environmental educator. He actually had a persona called Dr. Gavin Immer and he would go around and give uh, theater programs. Uh, that's my husband Jeff Wilson up there. Behind the scenes he's done more research and work on the turtle flambeau flowage in some of those northern lakes, housed researchers. Uh, so I uh, had the first, uh, Jerry Ballant, one of the early researchers, practically lived with him. Uh, so a lot of uh, those efforts. And you know, this slide I've got John Olson, retired from the DNR now, but he was on the advisory council, Pam Perry, Minnesota DNR. Um, uh, Dave Crehor, retired DNR uh, writer. He's got a book out uh, that he wrote about growing up in uh, northern Wisconsin. Woody Woodruff, he, was, uh, he ran the Loon Land Trading Company and Emporium in Minocqua, and he was one of our big fund drive people. He was an entrepreneur, sold everything from canned loon meat, theoretically, I don't know what was in those cans. <laughs> you know, every kind of gimmicky up to high-end loon paraphernalia, but he really believed in the program. Um, and on the far side, uh, Jane Pettit, Bra Jan Jane Bradley Pettit, she was a big funder of Loon Watch, and it goes to show that there was a time when uh, political uh, boundaries didn't matter in conservation. I think we need to get back to that. I used to call Jane, I had her personal phone number, I'd call her up once a year to ask her for a donation. She'd always answer the phone and say, oh, I'm just getting out of the shower, what can I do for you? And after, you know, the first year I was like, oh my gosh, she just got out of the shower. <laughs> the second year I was like, she was in the shower again? <laughs> By about year six, I was like, okay, she's going to be in the shower. <laughs> so she had a very polite way of putting people off, but she always sent us a big donation. Um, and then up in the very top, uh, that's a picture of me with an intern, but one of the important things was the Northland College students who became interns and work studies and work with us. That's Michelle Ethan, who now lives up in Alaska and I think is with the Forest Service. Um, but these people are really what made the program, and I think they we, obviously were giving to loons, but I think that we all got more out of the loons than we ever gave back. So I think what we, what we have to take forward is that uh, the relationships are really important. And uh, that's what really makes the conservation program last in the long run. So um, kudos to uh, Loon Watch for making it for 40 years.